thank you very much. It is so such happy a to be here uh, today. You were kind enough to come to Toronto, and uh, we had a lovely uh, yes, uh, meeting there. Yeah. So and, uh, and it's a privilege. It's an honor to be with you uh, today. Me too. And uh, we want to sh I, want, I wanted this talk to be a sharing of experiences for entrepreneurs in India who are now building global businesses uh, overall. Uh, your entrepreneurial journey has been amazing. Uh, you took risks in many, many cases right from the beginning. Um, and I came to know that you're a sports enthusiast. Very and much. And especially hockey. Uh, ice hockey in Canada? Ice hockey in Canada. Canada. Do you still play ice hockey? I, um, I, no, I never played ice hockey, but I played a lot of field hockey. Okay. And I thought field hockey was tougher because bigger uh, fields, uh, but ice hockey is unbelievable. You gotta be a very good skater, hmm. and it's up and down, up and down, up and down, and they have like, I think, 25 seconds, and then they go out and another guy comes So out. did I, playing ice hockey have anything to do with your becoming an entrepreneur? <laughs> no, I don't think so. Um, I became, I became, my father was a teacher ah. and the principal of the Hyderabad Public School. And so um, we, I didn't know anything about business, never bought a common stock in my life. And um, business was not talked about in, our, in my um, uh, home. Uh, we talked about education. My father was all about education. Education, yeah. I have to have some education. And so um, I was good in chemistry, so he so says, uh, and I luckily got into IIT, so he said, chemical engineering. I said, Dad, um, you're good at chemistry. Chem I was uh, 15 or 16 years old, and um, I really didn't like chemical engineering. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I went into, I did a business degree. Yeah. But I think there, if our research is correct, you took a risk. You already had admission into IAM. I Which was in IM. You were in IM, for and one that, month. that was the holy grail for Indian students. And then you suddenly said, "Drop this," and, and you went to Canada. And in Chennai, I met my wife to be. Yes. So I'm now uh, next year married for 50 years. Congratulations. So, um, uh, so I got my wife. I'm engaged, and I'm in IM. I'm the bad, and I'm happy. Right? Fantastic. They treat you so well, and I'm I'm the bad, best place uh, to go. And then my dad says, your brother has gone to London, Ontario. You should go. And I said, Dad, like, uh, I've got... Everything set here. Why would I uh, go? <laughs> but it was really my dad. And I was 22 years old. I listened to my uh, dad and um, went to London, Ontario. No money, no nothing, just went there. Um, but I don't know if I was such an entrepreneur. It was just, uh, you know... Your dad, your parents are very important in your life. Uh, your relatives, your uncle. My dad was very important in my life. <coughs> the teacher, the, he was an orphan oh. in India yeah. from a place called Mangalore, not Bangalore, but Mangalore. And, um, and then um, uh, was a very good cricket player mm -hmm. and became a um, um, uh, very good cricket player. Went into St. Aloysius College, no money but they took him because he was a good cricketer. And uh, then he became a teacher and Bachelor of Education, BA, MA. So you just, you basically listened to your dad and went to Canada. And how did you start Fairfax? Because I believe you were working in a company and did a management buyout. So I'll tell you, so um, um, I was working in an uh, insurance company. Right. And they taught me everything about investments. So I did an MBA from, uh, you know, so you have to, so I emphasize a lot of good fortune, a lot of good luck. And I happen to be a religious guy, so blessings from above. So I go to London, Ontario. That's the only place I can go because my brother's there. Okay. The best school in business is in London, Ontario. I can go there like, you know, um, um, someone can drive me. I, I, I don't have a car, but someone can drive me. It's like a few miles away. Now, how, how do you figure that out, right? Uh, nothing to do with me. So then I get a job. I got two jobs. One uh, job in, in 3M uh, as a finance guy. Remember, I don't have a clue about business. Another one was in Toronto in the investment business. Toronto, big city. I got married in um, uh, one year. Between my two years, I, in my second year, 
I couldn't, no money to go back to India. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, Nalani came over, we got married. Long story short, I go to this um, uh, company and um, a guy I'm working for, he says, forget what you learned. Here's a book on uh, security analysis by Ben Graham. Some of you may not have heard about this book, but Warren Buffett says the single best thing that happened to him was he read this book, Security Analysis by Ben Graham. Ben Graham. And so he says, you read the book. I read the book and I said, oh my God, this is the way to invest in the marketplace, take a long-term view. So um, uh, it was like, a, I say, a road to Damascus for me. Like I'm saying, this is what I want to do in my life. Totally fortuitous. I'm married, so I told my wife, I said, if, I, if we have a son, can we name him Ben? Really? Mm. <laughs> and we did have a son. We named him Ben, and that was like 44 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> so you joined the insurance business. So I joined the insurance business, learned about investments, right? So learned all about investments, managed money, had a few, a little bit locked it well. And, but the insurance company never paid, they paid you very little. If they paid a little more, I'd never left. Hmm. Talking about entrepreneurship. Yes. I was happy. It was a lovely place, good people. They're still my friends. Um, but then uh, a guy came in and said, why don't you uh, uh, start a company? You know, you're a bureaucrat, he said, come in. So I, I left and um, joined a small little company, small little company. And I was there for six months. Before I joined, the guy who hired me, he got laid off. Okay. So I don't know anyone there. And, um, uh, and I go in there. And in about six months, they say to me, Prem, like, there are, all your competitors are worried that you're coming in and you might take their business. And all. that led us to start us, our own company. And that was called? That was called Hamblin Watson. Uh, uh, investment council, investment council. So managing money, okay, all right. So like uh, a money manager, and um, and I thought, you know, our, we had a very good track record. So I thought in the first two months or three months, I'd get some money. We didn't get any money for one whole year, and somehow we survived. And um, and then uh, there were no VCs around. Eh? There were no VCs around. No, <laughs> <laughs> no you're right. Okay. So th th this. Um, a um, uh, company that I happen to know, they fired a, another manager, $50 million are there, and they gave it to us. Interesting. First big account. Okay. Next 10 presentations, you know, presentations, competition, we won nine of them. So one question, this $50 million account became your customer? Yeah. You, what were the three things which you think they looked at to give you that account. So that, uh, that was good. They, they, they knew me. Hmm. I had managed their money. Okay. I had cultivated them. So there's a relationship. A huge relationship. They did not, um, uh, they did not take the money from my old insurance company. Okay. They had three or four managers. They l took it from someone else and they gave it to us. But mm -hmm. one year later, they knew me. Our results were very good. And, um, and they um, said, uh, you know, $50 million. So the learning for the entrepreneur who's listening to us right now is strong relationships have to be cultivated. That's, and your relationship that you have, not new relationship, the relationship that you have is very important. Exactly right. And you have to cultivate it. And when you leave the organization, you have to keep making sure that you're close to them. And I, I knew everything about And it. I go back to the family because you mentioned that you had a very strong relationship with your uncles, with this thing. So family culture made a big difference here. Yes. Okay. Yeah. No, that's exactly right. Um, in, in terms of my family uh, made a big difference in terms of coming to Canada. But also my father had four children, my brother, my sister, myself, third, and my younger sister. And I say all the time that, you know, in India with a billion plus population, I won the ovarian lottery. Yeah. Good mother, good father, they looked after us. Yeah, yeah. He wasn't wealthy, he wasn't rich, but good values. Good education. Good education. Yeah. And, um, uh, you know, he, he, he was so proud of my education. That's right. 
my business success, I don't know yeah, what yeah. he's doing in business. <laughs> <laughs> so you went, you took the risk of going to uh, Canada. Yeah. Uh, you took the risk of your wife waiting for you. Yeah, for a year. For I a th year? I, th I thought I wouldn't ma get married for two years. But after a year, I said, I'm selling yes, air sir, conditioners yeah. and all. Come on And over. then you, uh, on the lighter side, of course. But then this client gave you the, the business because of relationship track record, yeah. which is very important. Did you cultivate this? Then I cultivated it, believe it or not, within a year, I'm studying um, uh, Buffett. This is like 1981, 82. No one knew about, no one mostly knew about Buffett. I go to his annual meeting. Today, that's 40,000. When I went in 1981, 82, 83, 200 people. Okay. So we're there listening to Buffett. <laughs> And his meeting finishes in about 10 minutes, and then he's asking, answering questions. So we're chatting there, and, uh, and, um, and I was like, um, you know, really impressed, because he's a value investor those days, small, in 1981, 82. And um, then one, um, um, uh, a fellow right up the, so I'm working in this company, right? And before I start my own company, I'm yeah. working in this boutique for six months. And, uh, the manager comes there and says, you know, value investing, please talk to this guy. Uh, he talks like you and, um, and uh, he's a very friendly guy. So I meet this guy called Francis Chu. And Francis Chu has no education. He hasn't gone to the University of Toronto. He went for a year and he got bored. And he tells me, in one hour, he tells me about Buffett. Here, I've already studied Buffett. And he's telling me about every acquisition he's made, and he introduces me to the concept of float. Mm -hmm. When an insurance company creates float, you get your premium, take some time to pay the claims, in between you get There's a float. float. Yeah. And, and I'm mesmerized by this, and he says um, uh, all about this float. And the point for your audience, is listen, because you don't know where the ideas came from. Here, this guy, I never met him. I spent some time, I'm thinking I'm doing him a big favor talking to him, and he tells me about the float. This is 1982, 83. And then, a small insurance company comes available, and another fellow comes to him, and he says, you know, you should meet this guy, Stephen Markell, his name was, Virginian from Virginia, and uh, he needs money. I have no money. But he says he needs money, and so I say, okay, I'll meet him. Love this guy. He's still a very good friend of mine. Uh, the 37, this is 1985, 37 years later. And um, he says, um, uh, Prem, uh, this, we <coughs> I hate to tell you, but we sat in a restaurant and we had a napkin, no paper, like, uh, <laughs> like Sudhir has. We had a napkin, so we put about seven points, you know. The, 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 and I had to raise five million. He said, you raise five million and you control the company. Really? So that was your first opportunity that and I was, presume you took Fairfax. it. That was Fairfax. You took it. That was Fairfax. That was Fairfax. Okay. That was risky. Excellent. Okay. I'll tell you a little more about but that. But how did you raise the five million? Hmm? How did you raise, was that from the, the float? The toughest five billion I ever raised. Mm -hmm. Right? So I go to my, I have to start my investment. I've got Hamlin Watts investment. So I have people like you, wealthy guys. So I come to you. I'm not a wealthy guy. <laughs> Well, they guy like this guy. <laughs> so I come in, and my first guy, you know, this is Canada, right? I don't know anyone. I meet this guy for the first time, and um, he's a client for about a year. So I say, Robert, I'm going to explain to you about this, and I need $2 million. So yeah, we have breakfast. I have all my stuff like this. And um, he says, uh, before breakfast, he says, how much money do you want? I said, $400,000. He says, $400,000? You got it right now, let's have a great breakfast. I said, no, I got my, I have to show Presentation. you. Presentation. I have to show you all of this, <laughs> numbers and all. You got 400000 So I raised two million out of that, five million like that. Seven okay. phone calls, two million. Then I needed that. That was your credibility. Yeah, my credibility, I knew these people and all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, yeah, these are people I knew, uh, not very well for a year or so. But they, um, you know, this is Canada, they like you and they give the money. 
It's not funny, you know. Like, and, and in India, it's even better for you entrepreneurs because you'll know all sorts of people. I didn't. Um, but then three million bucks, I went to every bank. They refused. And um, ultimately, no more alternatives. Every bank, every life company, every so you faced a lot of no's. They said, I'm 35 years old. And they're saying, you're starting a company, you've got no experience, you're running an insurance company. Uh, you know, how can we lend money to you? So then, I got no alternative. I'm about to give up. I, it never struck me that I'm working for an insurance company for eight or nine years, that they would lend me the money. So I go there. Last chance, go there. And the point is, never give up. So I go there, and they say, yeah, we'll lend you the money. Three million, I got the money, put the money um, um, to work, and, um, and I paid them the money back. They gave me a five-year loan, paid it in one year. They, they said, Prem, if you lose money, if you lose, I think it was about three million dollars. If you lose three million, um, uh, we're gonna pull your loan and we're gonna fire you. Yeah. And um, at the, we, uh, you know, you have these closing ceremonies. So we had a statue of the guy who did the deal and he had a gun. <laughs> the statue was with the gun. I kept it right in my office. Never <laughs> Remind <forget>. you every day. <laughs> Nine months we paid it. Excellent. And, um, in, uh, we did this in 1985, I'm not going to go year by year, but 1986, the point I'm trying to make to you entrepreneurs is you don't know what will happen in the future, so you have to be very prepared. So you've got to be financially sound, always. I'll make always. That point. Always financially sound. Always financially sound, because see what happened with COVID, suddenly shut down. 1985, uh, one month after we closed our deal, September 1985, October, and this is a trucking insurance company. 40% of all trucks are insured by this guy. Mm -hmm. And he goes bankrupt. Okay. You can't get insurance. How do you take a truck into the United States? This is States? one year after you took over Fairfax. Not, not one year, one month. Oh, one month, okay. We took it in September 1985. We knew this guy was back against the wall. He files for bankruptcy. He's trying to sell it to us. So now you took all our business in the past before I got involved um, at 30, 40% discount. We're not going to buy that. So long story short, um, um, they went bankrupt. Our business was 10 million. That's the company I bought, $10 million of business. And I raised 10 million of capital. Five million was the tough one. Then the other five came in for the ride. And October, these guys go bankrupt. So they, the next year, we write $60 million from 10 to 60, totally fortuitous. Right. So this guy goes bankrupt. And we are, ri ri we are writing it at huge prices, 40%, 50% up, 30%. And we run out of money. And this is a small public company. Stock is $3.25 when we did it. Stock goes to 10. We raised 2 million shares at $10 a share. We raised 20 million, put 5 million in the insurance company, 15 million for acquisitions. acquisitions. That's how we began. Very interesting. So the learning from the first half of our talk is value relationships immensely. Always. Always, whether Number personal one. or. All my life I've yeah. valued it. Right. And, uh, you, and to push that a little today, go the extra mile. Yes. Even if you're losing, make him um, a winner. Winner. Whatever the relationship yeah. you have. Yeah. Make him a supplier or something. Don't try to take advantage of him. Right. Make him a winner. Brilliant. Track record was created as you went by. <clears throat> you created credibility, which is very important. And fundraising is always very tough. It's not easy. The, the it's, it's, it's not easy. But you know, you, you, you must do something not to make money. You must do something you love. This is what you want to do in your life. Now, I'm 72 years old. I love doing what I'm doing today. And uh, I'm traveling to India. I'm going to the <coughs> Middle East. Uh, it's not business. I have to be a little careful at 72. But, but I love it. So and that's very interesting. So you no, let me just complete, and then I'll come back to this sure, last point perfect. which you make. So fundraising is tough. Never give up. That's Never the message up. you gave. Never Don't give up, up because Never. there is going to be... There is someone there who, if you've got a good idea, yes. you will get the money. Absolutely. And, and nowadays the narrative in the 
global markets is it's winter all over the place, you're saying no, spring is around the corner. That's right. Okay. Exactly right, Sudhir. And be always financially sound. Now, in the startup world, uh, financially sound means more capital because companies are making losses yeah. uh, overall. I'll come back to that later. Yeah. But be financially sound. And I love this last part, which is do something not for money. Yeah. And do something which you love doing yeah. uh, overall. Now, we'll take this forward and come back to the next question. You built Fairfax to, you're known as Warren Buffet of Canada. Right? That, I said that and $10 will get you a cup of coffee. <laughs> <laughs> and you built a Canadian leadership business and then you took it global, right? What made you take the business global? Yeah, because um, uh, we are Canada is a small country, right? Okay. So we are next to the United States. So we expanded in Canada. And United States, I guess. Hmm? And United States. And United States. And United States. States. First we expanded only in Canada. Only in Canada. So the first, uh, you know, say 10 years in Canada. We're a hmm. small company, right? 10 hmm. million. So we buy the second company. Then we buy the third company. And we buy the fourth company, which is a big company. So for you had four acquisitions. Four acquisitions. Okay. We grew through acquisitions. So our name, by the way, it used to be the previous owners, Markel Financial. Right. They own one company, Markel Insurance Company. Now we are expanding, so we had to change the name, name. of Markel Financial. So I went to my directors, they came out with some fancy uh, names, and my officers came out with some fancy names. My secretary was terrific. She says, why don't you go come out with Fairfax? I said, why Fairfax? Fair, F-friendly, AX acquisition. <laughs> Fair, friendly acquisition. Okay, that's the so origin I, of Fairfax. That's, that's how it began. So I took this name to my Virginian partners at that time, and they said Fairfax County in America, no problem. But uh, go with Fairfax. Oh, that's how Fairfax That's began. how Fairfax. First 100 shares in the stock market that was traded, we bought for her. Okay. Brenda Adams as her name. I said, Brenda, this is for you. <coughs> we put it in a nice uh, thing, uh, you know, framed. She couldn't sell it. She retired, I don't know, 15, 20 years ago, and, uh, and uh, it was worth a ton of money. <laughs> good, good. <laughs> so you grew through acquisitions and attained a dominant position in your industry in Canada. Yeah. You grew into US. So then we grew into the United US States. It. We bought our first company in the US. Again through acquisitions. Hmm? Again acquisitions. through acquisitions. Acquisition. We okay. grew through acquisition. We, property casualty business is, um, you can only grow so much um, internally. And um, so uh, the difference we had was most property casualty insurance companies, we learned this from Buffett, most property casualty insurance companies are run by insurance people. Mm. So the insurance guys, they don't care about the float. They don't know too much about insurance, about managing the float. So they just run it for insurance. We turned that around. Buffett turned it around. There's a few others in the United States that we studied. Turned that around. I said, we don't know anything about insurance. We'll hire the best insurance guy. Right. Let him run it. Tell him the parameters. Let him run it. But we'll run the float. And Which was the secret sauce, and that's which nobody did. No one did. And the secret okay. sauce is like huge. If you're a good investor. Yeah, yeah. It's the only holy grail. That's, yeah. that's. In MBA and in other narratives, I've always learned acquisitions are very dangerous. 90% fail or whatever that business is, but you built your business on acquisitions. And that's a running, in most startup scaled board businesses, this is what we discuss. Any comments? Very, very good point. Mm -hmm. When acquisitions take place, so you buy another company, you want to run the company. So you put it together, and usually you get rid of the management team. Right. Right? We do the opposite. So you keep we the management team. Keep the manage we will not buy a company if the management's not good. Okay. And then we- And doesn't want to stay. If they stay, only then. Yeah, only if they mm -hmm. stay. And then, we, uh, and this is in the insurance business, but it's true in our investments too. We want to have the management run it, and then we empower them. So our company today has about 20,000 people in the insurance business, just in there. Investments are like a whole ton more. But in the insurance business, 20,000 people all over the world, and um, our head office is 35 people. Interesting. So the, my people 
don't have the time to call all these people, right? Because they're busy doing their stuff. So the people in our companies today, you got, you know, just, I mean, I'm biased, empowered like you won't believe. The effect of that is the presidents who run those companies, 20 years, 25 years, 30 they stay years. longer. They're, they're all with us. And you can't take them because they think this is their company, and it is their company. They've hired the right people. They, so that you can't, you can't give them uh, twice the salary or $5 million, even in the United States. You can't take them out. So we've got uh, people, um, and our biggest company is Odyssey, and it's run by a guy who's been with us for 26 years, and uh, he brought another guy along uh, at the time he came in, because we bought this from a company that was you know, pretty well, uh, uh, very um, uh, poorly run at the time. And um, uh, they've um, uh, built the company, and uh, the fellow who was came in with the CEO, he's running it for the last 12 years. Excellent. So Excellent. we have stable management. So for all of you, first of all, you should think of, if you're building a business, build it for the long term. Don't try to make money. Don't, uh, don't try to make money as your first objective. The objective is to you have to have customers. So you have to provide outstanding customer service. service. Yep. Yeah, number one. I'm sorry to tell you a hundred times. You have to produce, you, you're not in business if you can't satisfy uh, the provide customer. customer service. Like what the customer wants. You gotta figure that out. Yeah. Then you have to, but who provides the service? Not you, not me, it's your employees. So you gotta look after them. So we're like very, very good in that. Like it's like a family business. We look after all of them. So when COVID, when COVID came, one thing I got, I don't usually tell our guys what to do, but I got them all together, our presidents, said you can't fire one person, even if you don't like them, because he can't go for an interview, he can't get a job, and so the, you can't fire anyone. Very interesting. So we never fired anyone, no drop in salary, no drop in bonus, we just rolled right through and we never missed a beat. Interesting. But the important thing was looking after your people. Like we just go the extra mile. I tell people, so, so they, when you start a company and you're young guys, you know, don't treat people like, you know, the, I don't like her, she's gone. You know, that's not how you treat people. I said, when you have to, you'll hire and you'll make mistakes, then you have to let some people yes, go. Yes, yes. Think that you're letting your brother go, your sister go, your your uncle, your aunt, right? Treat them like that. So you can do it nicely. You can say, okay, so this is not working out. Why don't you look for a job? You know, next three months, six months. It's easy to get a job when you're working. Yes. You know, stuff like that. Just be compassionate. Yeah. And give them uh, a soft landing. Yeah, like look at, yes, give them a soft landing. So look at this, like a Ford. You know, they say they're lay, laying off 20,000 people. What, what kind of company is that that lays off 20,000 people? And people have said to me that if that guy who made the decision, if he knew five people, their families, he'd never make that no. decision. He is, but they're so, all numbers. You know, so MA conditional to the team staying is very important. It's huge, right? What, what, what else have you yeah. have in a business? You uh, entered so just that thing. So you got the um, uh, customers, you got employees, you have to make money. Uh, I'm sorry, even in, um, in, you have to figure a way to profits. Profits. Somehow you got to make money. And then you, ha you are lucky, you're doing well. Don't forget people who are not doing well. So you help the community you are in, help um, uh, wherever and whatever you can do, help <coughs> the communities that you do business in. You entered India. Uh, and you're one of the largest investors in India. On the infrastructure side, one company in insurance. Yeah, uh, the startup business is in emerging right now. Yeah, and uh, what's your view on the startup technology businesses, uh, and how does Fairfax look at this new India? Till I met you, I didn't realize what a wonderful world the startup world okay. is. <laughs> he gave me all sorts of examples. We um, our startup a great success for us was Kamesh Koya, yeah. first unicorn in 2021 in the insurance business. And Kamesh is uh, steeped in insurance. He's not a tech guy. He became a tech guy. Digit. This is Digit. Eh? Very uh, Digit. Yeah. The, the name of the company is Digit. 
And, um, you know, in five years, he started from scratch. He's got a billion dollars of business. He's profitable. And he's got about 3,000 people, which is what India needs, right? The ability to all of these uh, people in the startup world that you are so familiar with are creating companies, creating jobs. But what I love about what you're doing and what others are doing in these unicorns and startups is that it doesn't make a difference. India had, you know, I'm an Indian, I left at 22 years, I'm now 50 years in Canada, but India had the caste system and you had servants who could never go up. And now, doesn't make any difference, right? You could be whatever your caste, whatever your male, female, whatever your religion, you get a good idea, so they're coming and putting money with you. He wants to um, back you, right? You don't, you don't care what that. Yeah. Yeah. Did they go to I am Ahmedabad? Did they go to IIT? It doesn't matter. Who, who cares, right? Yeah. Fantastic. That's the beauty of America and Canada. United States, Bastion of Free Enterprise. I see that in the US. After being 50 years, I see that. Opportunity, effort. they don't care. So you got Satya Nadella running Microsoft. How can that happen? Yeah. Because he's the best guy. And they say, you know, yeah, you're, the guy Raj Subramaniam is running FedEx. FedEx. So um, Fred Smith says, and this is in the southern part of the United States, you know, a little discriminatory there. Fred Smith says, you're the guy. Raj says, 600,000 employees at FedEx. Are you sure I can do it? The other guy he says, you're gonna do a terrific job. But this is, this is how it works, right? And that's the new India here right now. That's, that, um, that is what Mr. Modi has created. Yes. Single-handedly, I may add, I'm such a passionate guy about Mr. Modi uh, because I know what existed prior to that. This idea of socialism is such a, a curse on a country. I, uh, nothing else I can say, um, but uh, I've traveled all over the world, and countries which are free enterprise oriented, which are business friendly, is unlimited. What, I mean, look yeah. at all the companies that um, you were telling me about and you introduced me to, right from scratch. That's right. But they're creating jobs, they're creating GDP. They're creating enormous value. Creating um, enormous yeah. value. For so, Graham, global economies, um, three detrimental effects of COVID, uh, supply chain, um, the war, yeah. uh, global economies, especially Western economies, probably growing at 1% to 3% per annum. Yeah. Uh, Canada, I think, is at about 1% GDP growth. Yeah. Any message for global investors or Canadian investors, how do they look at the digital world in India, the startup world in India? I say this publicly and I'm saying it here, the number one country to invest in is India. Number one country by far. Uh, it's a democracy, the biggest democracy in the world and uh, the oldest democracy in America and they're working so together. well together. So there's unlimited, look at the, the, um, uh, the, uh, the fellow who backed you, took your whole... Uh, Pat McGovern. Uh, what, 180 million? 150 million. 150 million, yeah. took the whole thing. That's America here. I mean, talking about you hadn't done anything, right? That was right in the beginning. And um, they came uh, to Toronto and they were telling me the story. I mean, it's um, just amazing. That's happening here. And you're doing that now in, um, uh, in India. So I think India is um, one tremendous uh, place to invest. I think Mr. Modi will uh, stand for election in two and a half years. I've got that book, Modi 20. Yes, you gave it to me. I gave it to you, yeah. and I put a little inscription there. I saw that, yeah. And I said, how can a guy, the Honorable Prime Minister, how can he, um, no education, a tea seller's son, and how does he go and get elected three terms in Gujarat, 10% economic growth, gets a 1.3 billion population, he gets a majority, and then he gets a higher majority. Why? Book explains it all. And I think, you know, we're just fortunate, we're blessed to um, have, um, uh, I, I say he'll, he'll be known as the greatest statesman, because Lee Kuan Yew did a wonderful job for Singapore, but it was like five, six, seven million, million people. people. Yeah. 
1.3 billion people with the democracy, all of the different points of view to raise the standard of living is quite, um, quite amazing. Yes. Um, uh, um, Prem, thank you. You're meeting uh, three of our entrepreneurs, uh, Nitin from Global Bees, you're meeting uh, Ram from Vina and Ashish from uh, earlier Rally Salary and now five today. But in your next visit, I'm gonna request you to give us two hours so that you can meet more entrepreneurs, <laughs> right? I'd love to do that. I, more I, get, I get a kick out of meeting entrepreneurs, yeah. especially the guys who've started from scratch. And I mean, yeah. it's quite amazing. Absolutely. But I must tell you, uh, you're doing some wonderful work in uh, India, and entrepreneurs like you, uh, um, venture capitalists like you, providing money for these uh, young people, you were telling me 22, 23, 24 yeah. years old, um, doesn't make a difference. Um, uh, what their background is. Uh, in that book, I thought, uh, you know, uh, so there it was um, wonderful where one of the guys, young guys said, Mr. Modi taught us to dream again. Yes. That anything is possible. And you say, you show that uh, so beautifully in all these people that. Uh, no, absolutely. And, and I think, uh, again, request you to meet thousands of entrepreneurs in the next five years, right? Yeah. India's about scale. Yeah. Uh, and exactly. congratulations on the airport. Yeah. The Bangalore Airport T2, what a wonderful place. What a wonderful Sustainable, place, right? uh, friendly, and uh, I hope it becomes a gateway to India. That uh, airport is the best in the world. Yeah. And when people come to Bangalore and see the airport, this guy, uh, uh, Hari Marar, who's um, built this thing, this is his dream. He works day in and, as your entrepreneurs do, work day in and night out to do it Build together it, yeah. with the team yeah. and um, and uh, phenomenal. Some of you will, most of you will come to Bangalore sometime. This is the software capital of the world and uh, and you'll see this airport. But it's been Excellent. a pleasure to talk Thank to you. Thank you so much. Thank you very and much. And really pleasure to have you. Thank you And very look much. forward to many more entrepreneurs meeting you and learning from you and getting motivated. I'd love to, I'd love to meet you again. Thank you, sir. Yeah, thank you, sir.